before I begin, I'd just like to say that I very much appreciate and listening to all these speeches. Um, they were very inspiring. I found myself nodding my head during all of them. Adam, I think, uh, remember when you said that 60-foot wave hit your bow and you were re-examining your life? Uh, I was re-examining my speech at that time. <laughs> wow, that was powerful stuff. And uh, what Julie said about perfectionism and now that inhibits moving forward and inhibiting growth. I actually thought about giving my speech on that. And, but I, I never thought about how that related to sexism. And that was very poignant. I very much agreed, that, or agreed with that and appreciated that. And I am glad I'm the one speaking after Jazz, because I, I really was afraid to hear what he thought about photo bloggers. <laughs> uh, but it was a very powerful speech. And uh, I'm just glad to be here. And I learned a lot. And, uh, during dress rehearsal, I was a few minutes under, uh, and they told me I could kind of improvise and say things. So before I start, I, I want to teach you guys something that I learned, that if you, if you forget everything else, this might help you. And this is a way to kind of deflect anxiety and, and deflect awkwardness. Like, for example, you know, the source of anxiety a lot of times or embarrassment is when all the attention is focused on you. Like, say you walk into an empty lunchroom, not a crowded lunchroom, excuse me, and everybody's sitting down, and you're the only one standing up, and you're walking across the lunchroom, and you can feel everybody looking at you, and you, you start, your pace starts to get off a little bit. <laughs> what you need to do is you need to deflect that attention back on the crowd. And one way to do that is make eye contact with everybody in the lunchroom. Look at them, you know? <laughs> deflect that attention back on them. And it's just something I want you guys to remember. And with that being said, there's, there's one thing I, I'd like to do before I begin. <laughs> would, you, would you mind straightening up your shoulders a little bit? <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. All right, so now, now with the rest of my speech, I, I think I should be getting close to my limit here. So. So I'd like to point out the irony in me speaking at Columbia, because this school's admissions department has a very sophisticated screening process just to keep people like me out. Uh, my, my grades were nowhere near good enough. Uh, in fact, I think there is a plaque at my alma mater that says something about this. And, and I'll tell you, I was going to keep this vague, but after se seeing Jazz's speech, this was because I was too high to withdraw from my classes. <laughs> and that's a very difficult thing to do. Now, I can joke about it now because I turned things around. I graduated, and things are going very well now. But when I was flunking out of the University of Georgia, and I did end up going back, uh, I never thought I'd be speaking at Columbia. So I appreciate all you guys having me. Thank you. <laughs> and. So I wasn't really invited to, you to speak here today because I'm necessarily an expert at anything, but rather because I've stumbled upon a very interesting profession. And that is, I walk around the streets of New York City all day long, and I stop people on the street, I take their photograph, and I find out a little bit about them. And I do this in a very systematic way. I walk several miles a day. I stop about six or seven people on the streets. I take their photograph. I find out a little bit about them. And every night, I post that on my blog, Humans of New York, in somewhat this format. <laughs> and uh, today, I want to explain something that I've noticed in the process of doing Humans of New York. And this is something that's kind of t tangentially related, if that's a word. Uh, it's not something I noticed when I was stopping individuals <clears throat> on the street, but st something that I noticed when I was working crowds or I was photographing at events that a lot of other photographers were present at. And what I notice is that, say there were like 10 photographers representing the media companies from you know, around New York, around the world. Instead of being distributed throughout the crowd, all these photographers would be fighting for the exact same photographs. They'd be surrounding the same people. And those people normally represented the most extreme elements of the crowd. For example, at Occupy Wall Street, it was the extremely weird. At the World Trade Center Memorial on the uh, September or anniversary of September 11th, it was the extremely emotional. And at the Gay Pride Parade, as you can imagine, it was the extremely gay. <laughs> and so I started noticing and seeing this over and over again. I started to notice that press coverage was following a pattern at all of these events that I was going to. Instead of distributing themselves throughout the crowd and kind of providing a representative coverage of all the attendees, 
all the press seem to be focused around a single individual or a small group of individuals. And oftentimes, those individuals look like this or this or this. And this one's especially interesting because this is a photograph I took. And it was at the 10th anniversary, September 11th. And it's a very moving photograph, right? And it, it tells a story. And it appears to show you know, a woman sharing a very private, serene moment of grief. But when in reality, it was a complete circus scene around this woman. There were like all the photographers at the entire event were just swarming around this woman. The flash bulbs were going off in her face. I, I can't, I mean, she, she did an extremely good job to hold that pose and all of that madness. And I was right in there thick of it because I knew that was, the, that was the photo for the event. That was the story. And so as I fought with other photographers to get that photo, I realized what it was that me and all the other me members of the media have in common. And that is we're all desperate to tell a good story. Now, facts are important, but facts aren't what sells newspaper. Facts aren't what keeps the media in business. Good stories keep the media in business. So in, in the final analysis, it's a reporter needs to be factual, but that's not their job. Their job is to tell a good story. And so I'd like to analyze what that phenomenon translates into the real world and translates into our experience and our interaction with media. So I think I'd like to start by looking at what makes a good story. And I thought a good place to look at that would be to examine the most popular form of storytelling in our culture today, and that would be movies. So let's start out by reasons we watch movies. Violence is one of them. Danger is another. Sex. Conflict. And if you follow my blog, you know my personal favorite, puppies. <laughs> now, let's see how those things translate into the reasons that we read stories. <laughs> Now, since the media's job is to tell us stories, it would only make sense that they're telling us the stories that we're the most interested in hearing. That's good business. Otherwise, we change the channel or we pick up a different newspaper. So the reason that the news today is packed with crime, sex, and violence is the same reason that movies are packed with crime, sex, and violence. Because those things make for an exciting story. Those are the things that keep our attention. So if the media is filled with these things, it's only because they're giving us exactly what we want to hear. And so it's important to realize that the news we hear is largely a reflection of what we find interesting, as opposed to a reflection, a representative reflection of the world in, in general. And so when we pick up the newspaper in the morning or turn on the television in the evening, we're not necessarily seeing reflection of the real world. We're seeing reflection of our interests. We're presented with a world that's more violent, more dangerous, and more sexy than the one we actually live in. And when we hear and see these stories over and over and over again, it's important to stop for a second and think about how receiving all these images of extremes are changing our perception of the real world around us. So due to the fact that I couldn't really afford a television, for the first year and a half I was in New York, I never really saw a single local news story. You know, I was just out on the streets all day long taking photographs. And you know, I probably walked about 2,000 miles, stopped thousands of strangers on the streets of New York, took thousands of portraits. And you know, during that time, I was going out of my way to stop people that I might normally afraid, be afraid of stopping. People like neo-Nazis, biker gangs, large groups of tattooed males. And this is actually kind of a funny story. Um, they, they had this real tough look on their face when, when I was just getting set up to take a photo. But then I took two steps back and just stepped into an open fire hydrant and just drenched myself. So this is them trying to look tough, like looking at me just absolutely soaked. <laughs> so, and, you know, and that interaction is kind of representative of what I'm trying to say, is that I stopped thousands of people in every neighborhood in New York, and everybody was pretty nice. And you know, that's pretty amazing given New York's reputation as being a very dangerous city, one where you just kind of keep to yourself and don't talk to strangers. And you know, there were a few rude brush offs and I guess some moments that I felt on edge, but you know, I was always very careful. And you know, from 
my experience on the streets of New York, I began to develop a very genial view of the city. You know, <laughs> and, and even, <laughs> And, and even in neighborhoods that we, you know, we're told to be afraid of, you know, the ones that actually, if you're looking at a crime map, are just some black splotch, you know, what I normally found is just people living normal lives. 99.99% was just normal people. And it's kind of interesting because this picture um, was actually taken in the same neighborhood that uh, Marjora, I believe her name was, grew up in. And I, you know, I, I recognized it from when she was talking. So, you know, and even when I was in some of these neighborhoods, you know, I'd have people come up to me and say, like, do you know where you are? I'd, I'd been photographing this neighborhood for a week, just stopping everybody. And people would come up to me on day seven and be like, do you know where you are? You can't, you can't talk to people in this neighborhood. You know, you can't stop people in this neighborhood. And I'd just be like, well, I've been doing it all week. And I did it last week, too. And I started to realize that there was something about people's perceptions of a place, and especially if people lived outside of the neighborhood, and they'd never been there, and they just heard about it. It's just like, oh, I've seen that on the news. You don't go there. And I started to realize that there was something about people's perceptions of reality, and New York and specifically, that was different than what I was experiencing on the streets. And I was wondering what it was that caused those perceptions to be so different. And then one night I was at my girlfriend's house, and I happened to catch a local news story. And all I was seeing were stories of violence and rape and murder. And all these things were happening in the exact same neighborhoods I was walking through every day. And I had this moment of self-doubt, I remember. I was thinking, is this stupid, what am I doing? Am I just hopelessly naive? You know, am I? Am I just playing with fire? It, it, are the neighborhoods a lot more dangerous than I realize? But then you know, I kind of let it sink in for a while and started reflecting. And then I realized something, that the local news wasn't covering the whole city. They weren't covering this or this or this <laughs> or this. <laughs> They were reporting on the most extreme and interesting element of the city. And that looked like this. And it suddenly became clear to me why everyone seems so overly afraid of certain neighborhoods. Because these were the only stories they were hearing about those neighborhoods. Every night when they turn on their television, they aren't hearing about the normal people living normal lives. They were hearing about the rapists, the drug dealers, and the murderers the violence, the danger, the sex, and the conflict. And like I said before, and I don't want to criticize the media because it's nobody's fault. They're giving us what keeps us watching the television or buying their newspapers and keeps them in business. But because the media makes money by telling us important, interesting stories, it's important for us to realize how that affects us, that the world does not as dangerous, as violent, or as sexy as the one that's being presented to us with inside the television. 99.99% you know, of the life being lived is not that overly exciting. And therefore, it's not getting reported on. So is the world a benign, safe, unexciting place? No, and I'm not trying to say that. The world is sexy. There are passionate love stories. There's inequality. Some people are homeless. Others are addicted to drugs. People fight. People grow old. Tragedies happen. People do die, sometimes violently. There is crime, 
and in a nod to jazz, there's police brutality. And a few people commit a lot of crimes. So I, I want to be absolutely clear that the point I'm making is not that bad things don't happen. But because of the way that the media searches for these bad things and amplifies them, they don't happen nearly as much as we imagine. The media's job isn't to tell us representative stories of the world. It's to tell us exciting stories and good stories. Because if not, we'll change the channel. But when you go to sleep at night and you turn off the TV, know that the world outside your window isn't nearly as dangerous or violent as the world inside the TV. It's still filled with people <laughs> that have very interesting stories. They're just not always exciting enough to make your local news. Thank you very much. <laughs>